Hey, hey, hello, everyone. I just want to make sure that I am not muted and I'm not. And so, hello, welcome to another Facebook Live. And uh, I've changed the camera a little bit. I've moved my camera a little bit further away, moved my iPad uh, somewhere in between my computer and my camera so that I could actually look at you while I'm also uh, speaking to you. So, uh, I hope you're doing well. If this is the first time you're joining me, please uh, tell me uh, where you're from. If you've joined me several times, tell me how many you've seen of these Facebook Lives and where you're joining us from. It's great doing these. I'm doing them every Tuesday and Thursday. I started because of the quarantine, but I found that I enjoy them so much that I actually am going to keep doing them. As long as you guys keep showing up, I'm going to keep doing them, and I always have stuff to share. In addition to that, uh, I think last Thursday, yep, I think last Thursday I was uh, using uh, this space to do a little bit of a kind of rant about where the world was and what I was feeling, but uh, that's changed. Um, I'm not here really to spout my political views. Uh, there's plenty of other places where you can hear people screaming and yelling about what they're feeling and their frustration levels. And I'll let those people actually do that. Um, where I feel I can give you the biggest contribution is on the entrepreneurial process, how you can grow your business, whether it's in times like these or in better times, doesn't matter. Um, I've been at this game for about 20 years helping other businesses grow. I've been working on my own businesses for longer than that. And uh, I'm just happy to have everyone here. And I am glad that you're joining me today. We're going to talk about how do you really think your way to a better business? How do you think your way to growing your business? And along those lines, uh, I am definitely here also to answer your questions. So uh, feel free to, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, feel free to uh, put in the chat what your questions are, and I will do my very best to answer them. It might be a little bit until I get to them, but trust me on the fact that your questions are important to me. It's one of the reasons that I do this, and I really am here to make a difference for you, to help you be better, get better, get richer, get more successful, get your business better. And so your questions mean a lot to me because it's how I can be most impactful to you. And odds are, if you have a question, other people have it as well. Um, so with all that said, I did want to also put a link up to our Facebook group because uh, we're going to be talking about stuff that came from what I gave away last week. And just to kind of get back on that uh on the uh, what I was talking about last Thursday, the politics, what was really interesting about talking about politics, or at least not politics, but the current situation, my frustration with it was how much interaction there was and how much more interaction there was, even from the same group or same number of people as there normally is. So don't let the fact that I'm not ranting and raving prevent you from giving a thumbs up or giving a heart or sharing or commenting because at the end of the day the reach of this live stream is dependent the organic reach at least is dependent on the interaction that we have the engagement that you show and so if you appreciate what i'm doing you know if you're watching a youtube uh video they're always asking you to subscribe give it a thumbs up and uh you know for any any YouTube contributor that I like, I always try and do all those things. You can only subscribe once, but, uh, but I do do give it the thumbs up and all those things because like, I want to make sure that that YouTube contributor does, uh, thrive. And so if you're enjoying these Facebook lives, I, I would appreciate you do the same thing for me. Just make sure that you're as interactive as you can be, because that's what Facebook uses to determine whether this, they should show this live stream to other people like yourself. And so, uh, you know, and the last thing I want to do is really come here each and every week ranting and raving about politicians, even though that seems to actually stimulate more interaction, because that I just don't see that in my place in the world. And I don't see how that makes the world a better place. Um, so anyway, as you can see here, I put a link to our free Facebook group and uh, it's called the Conversion Club group. Facebook does not endorse this in any way, shape or form uh, in case later on uh, Facebook prevents me from boosting this saying that I'm somehow implying by putting this link that Facebook is endorsing this. Uh, they prevented me from 
doing one of these, uh, boosting one of these videos because of that, surprisingly enough. And, uh, and in addition to that, uh, what I shared in the last Facebook live was, you know, my feelings about things, but then the bigger takeaway that I hope was there for everyone is that you really need to begin thinking for yourself. And today we're going to really follow up on that line of thinking that there really is no one that can do better thinking for your business than you yourself. And too many people are outsourcing their thinking. They're hoping that others figure things out for them. And, you know, I've known as the guru to the gurus. And one of the things that you can say every guru has in common is, is that they're willing to do the thinking, right? They're willing to think new thoughts, experiment with new ideas. And that's how new methods, new strategies, new tactics are created. Um, and I'm not suggesting necessarily that you aspire to break new ground in, you know, areas of online marketing or not. What I am uh, hoping that I convey to you is, is that no one's going to think more about your business than you should be. And that quite often, mo a lot of people I meet don't do any thinking. And I'm not talking about like giving thought like you would give thought to what you want to have for dinner tonight or giving thought to who should you call or what should app should you open up in these free five minutes that you have. I'm talking about heavy duty thinking, thinking that makes your brain tired, thinking that actually can move the needle. And so I wrote this report over a decade ago called The Hidden Obstacles to Your Success. And you can find that report. It's about 100 and some odd pages long, I think 108 pages long. You can find that report in the Facebook group that I, I posted it there for free, even though we used to charge $97 for it, um, because I really believe that one of the most beneficial things that any entrepreneur could ever do is think for themselves. But especially at a time like right now, it's even more important. And so I want to just thank you for being here. I see that a lot of comments are coming in and I'm certainly going to be addressing each and every one of you that has um, given a comment. And let me know if you can notice the difference in the camera. I notice the difference. It looks like it's clearer and that the background is a little fuzzier. Um, if you do notice it, let me know. Uh, I'm going to be, where the hell is, are the different seats? Uh-oh, um, where, oh, there they are. Okay, so, um, so I also mentioned uh, in the last uh, Facebook Live that uh, I was reading a book, uh, The Road to Less Stupid, written by, I forget the gentleman's name, sorry, um, that was very similar to The Hidden Obstacles to Your Success. Um, I think it has actually less content than The Hidden Obstacles to Your Success, but just as valuable, if not more so, because it actually gives you lots of questions. And questions really are the gateway to thinking. Uh, in fact, one of my early online mentors, in fact, I think he was my first online mentor, really, Stephen Pierce, uh, who got me on my first stages, really helped me kind of get into the game. And I owe a ton to Stephen Pierce. Um, he was so into questions that he used to collect them. And I learned that from him, that um, that you know, the right question at the right time can open up tremendous doors for you. And so one of the things that I've done since then has always been to collect questions. And I came across a site the other day um, that actually is a site that's just dedicated to questions. And um, maybe later on towards the end of the, the uh, Facebook Live, I will ferret that out. It's not anywhere that is easy for me to reach. But so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to think better. And I thought no better way to do that than to actually open up the report that I want to give you if you haven't taken advantage of it already for free. And then I also have another um, I have another PDF. I don't know that I'm going to give it away. Um, I don't know that it will make a lot of sense to give it away, but we'll open it up and then we'll take a look and see if it's valuable. Um, what it is, is it's a summary of that was made by a student of mine for other students in this program that I did in 2008. And so in 2008, I taught a course called uh, Guided Profit Systems, GPS. And, you know, it's kind of a whatever name, right? Kind of kitschy or whatever, uh, gimmicky. But 
there was a there was an idea behind it that made a lot of sense to me, and that's why we named it that, especially back in 2008. And that is, is that uh, GPS, what it taught was theory of constraints and not like what you learn by reading the book, The Goal, which was a great book. And that's written by Eli Goldratt, the founder of theory of constraints. But the book, The Goal is really just a, a parable. And it just really is to open your eyes about the idea of constraints. And constraints are very easy to understand when you're thinking about talking about analyzing a manufacturing business. Because in general, you're going to be looking for where does the pipeline kind of get narrow? Where does the flow uh, get held back? But in service businesses, in most systems, finding the constraint is nowhere near as easy as it is in a manufacturing system. And so the people of theory of constraints, the, the smart physicists that worked around Eli figured out a whole mapping kind of rules of logic way of getting access to where the problems in a business were and then peeling back the layers of those problems to get to the root causes and the constraints that were responsible for those root causes. And so I taught this course in 2008 that taught that entire process. And normally um, someone needs to go away for about two weeks uh, for full-time study, generally, I think like eight o'clock in the morning till almost eight o'clock at night every day, uh, for 14 days to learn theory of constraints, uh, and become quote unquote, what's called the Jonah. And, uh, so I had this ambitious goal of trying to teach people all of that material in an hour to an hour and a half a day, uh, for 30 days, I ended up having to extend it to 45 days and ended up having to do Q and A's for like four or five hours a day. All this was done live streaming back in 2008 um, so that I could make sure that no one fell behind because theory of constraints was cumulative. And so if you didn't get lesson two by lesson four, you were completely confused. And so this PDF, which is why I was telling you about in the first place, was created by uh, some of my students for other students uh, of that program. And I have never really released that program after that. Uh, primarily because even though it was incredibly powerful, got people amazing results, I didn't, I've given it to some of my best clients, big clients that I knew were disciplined, intelligent, and like had a serious work ethic because I knew they could go through it and they did and they got great results. But the average person I think would be somewhat lost in this. I think, uh, they wouldn't have the discipline to kind of go through lesson by lesson methodically. And so I've never re-released it, although maybe at some point I'll figure out an easy easier way to teach such complex stuff. And if I can, I certainly will. Um, but it's hard. Um, but there is some really powerful information in there. And for those who don't really understand anything about theory of constraints, let me just explain it. The most simple metaphor, this will be more similar to what a manufacturing kind of, uh, analysis would be. But, um, if you think about, uh, a chain made up of links, right? And let's say the chain can hold 500 pounds, right? Um, when you put 510 pounds on that chain, right, to hold, it breaks. And it doesn't break in all of the links, it breaks in one link. And so that link is the constraint from that chain holding more than 500 pounds. Now, what the, what the, conceptually you need to understand is, is that if you add more power to every link in the chain, you've really done a lot of waste, a lot of false efficiency, right? You could add 10 extra pounds of, of weight bearing to every link in the chain. But if you have a hundred links in this chain, most of that extra uh, strength will be wasted, right? Because there's only one link that broke at 510, right? And so the idea behind theory of constraints is to figure out what is that link? What is the one link that is preventing a system from being able to get more of its output? Every system is constrained in some place, right? Uh, our body is a system. At some point, each and every one of us until, you know, science evolves are going to die. And we're not going to die because of a hundred things going wrong. We're going to die because one thing went wrong and then it rippled into other things, but it's that one thing, right? So you could have an extremely healthy heart, 
But if your liver fails, you're going to die, right? And so anything to make your heart better at that moment is a false efficiency, just like anything added to any of the chains that are not the one that's going to break would be a false efficiency as well. So I taught this course about how do you find that, right? And, and, and once you find it, what do you do about it so that you can eliminate that constraint? Now, every system always has a constraint. We won't live forever. A car doesn't go an infinite speed. A business doesn't make infinite profits. So as soon as you get rid of the current constraint, a new one shows up, but it shows up at a higher level of output or flow. And so that's why uh, every system is always limited. It's limited by its constraint. And the easiest way to improve the performance of a system is to remove the current constraint. And that's the highest leverage point in any system. And when that's done, then the performance will go up, but it will then be stopped at the next constraint, wherever that is. And so that was the whole logic behind um theory of constraints and why I taught GPS. Someone just asked me about D3. I saw that go through the comments. And so D3, uh, also none of these, like right now I don't offer these courses. So I hope you understand I'm, I'm mentioning these because I think they're helpful conceptually for you to understand. Like if you've never really understood theory of constraints, hopefully my explanation of what GPS was now helps you kind of appreciate what it was. And also that it's a mode of thinking that, is like I used to start out my presentation about theory of constraints, asking entrepreneurs who you know were in the room, at the end of the day, what do you think is more important, how you think or what you know? And in my opinion, it's how you think. It's not what you know, because what you know becomes quickly outdated, especially online. Uh, you know, every year online is even going faster than dog years. Um, so what you know today will quickly be outdated tomorrow, next month, next year. But how you think and how you're able to spot opportunities, where to press forward, where to retrench um, is all a function of how you think. And your life is really the cumulative effect of all of your thinking. Where you are right now in life is the cumulative effect of all your thinking. And most of us don't think enough. We don't really spend very much time doing hardcore thinking because it's not easy. It's not pleasant. And, uh, and generally there is, uh, there's resistance to getting into that space. There's a million things that are more pleasant to do, uh, than thinking. Right. And so one of the things that I've done for my, for the last 20 plus years, and I never thought I would be someone who did is keep a journal. Um, I've kept journals exactly like this one, um, for the last 25 years or so. And, the reason I keep a journal is, you know, it's nice and interesting to read what I was doing like 20 years ago today, but that's not why I keep a journal. The reason I keep a journal is it's the only way that I know to force myself to think daily. If I didn't, if I wasn't thinking in my journal, I don't know where I'd spend my time thinking because like I'm away from the computer, I'm pen and paper in hand, right? And I'm, I'm exploring different questions and, uh, uh, and so that is where I do my thinking. And if you don't have a place that is outside of your computer, that is a place where you go, that where you sit down and actually spend time thinking, odds are is that you're not doing thinking. So, yeah, so D3 was a course that I created, had nothing to do with, well, everything has to do with thinking, right? But um, this was my marketing course. And, you know, it's interesting because I was actually reviewing some other marketing courses recently. I actually had a great conversation yesterday with a copywriter that I admire, Sean Vossler. He has a great book. You've probably seen it advertised if you've been on Instagram. It's the most well-designed copywriting book I've ever seen. And it incorporates a lot of other things from the marketing side um, that, uh, that you won't find in most um, copywriting books. And uh, so anyway, we were talking about it and we were talking about marketing, et cetera. And a lot of my marketing methods, which I created, are still somewhat unique, not very well known, although I've seen uh, I've seen a sprinkling of some of the concepts in other courses. And for those who are not that familiar with me, you know, I started marketing online in about 2002. I really made my name known 
back in 2006 when I wrote a report called the Internet Business Manifesto. I was the first internet business coach, you could say, or the first business coach online. Uh, and I was able to create a market for that when there was no market um, by writing a report that convinced people that what was holding them back was a lack of knowledge in business building. And because that worked so much better than I ever expected, I was hoping to get like a dozen or uh, or so clients, and I ended up getting thousands of clients from that report. It went viral. It got downloaded over a million times in two years, about two million times in five years, and you know we had we stopped counting a long time since then. Uh, but it was so it so exceeded my dreams that my life really changed. And and I went from you could say that there was my life before the manifesto. And there was life after the manifesto. And that worked so well that I really would be a fool if I didn't write a bunch of other reports. And so I wrote a series of about seven reports over the next 18 months. And, you know, that was the missing chapter, the final chapter, then the Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2. And then the Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2, which I wrote in 2007, I predicted that attention would become the scarcest commodity online. And then the Attention Age Doctrine 2 was all about where attention was going to go. And it was going to go to social media. And then I wrote the Maven Matrix Manifesto, which I wrote with Jay Abraham, which was that there was going to be this um, explosion of choice and that people were going to look for experts and authorities online. And since Jay had been behind more offline gurus than anyone else, and I had been behind more online gurus than anyone else, we compared our notes and we kind of created a document, a uh, free report on what you had to kind of master in order to be a maven of a market or an authority or a guru or whatever you want to call it. We actually still use that report inside of Agora to help position our gurus. And then I wrote my last report, which happened to be my second best performing report as far as downloads, as far as sales. I think the least I ever made from a report was about two million, two and a half million. The the Internet Business Manifesto made me tens of millions. Um, the Entrepreneurial Emergency, not as much as the first one, but more than any of the others, um, was all about theory of constraints. But it wasn't about theory of constraints. It was about how most entrepreneurs spend most of their time adding more potential and that adding more potential doesn't equal added levels of success. And so if you're, if you've been adding more potential, but you're not experiencing more success, it's probably because you have a constraint. And I think that that's a great example to explain what D3 was, which D3 was about me teaching how I was able to consistently create courses that no one else had at the time that no, no customer was looking for at the time and create a, perceived need, but, you know, underneath a real need that customers would then see and appreciate what it was that I was offering. So I can assure you that back in 2008, nobody was looking for, nobody in internet marketing was looking for a course on theory of constraints. But because I wrote a report that convinced people, like, because I shared what I knew to be true, that it was their constraints, not their potential that was really going to determine their level of success and they had never considered their constraints i was able to convince a significant amount of entrepreneurs that getting serious about their uh about understanding and learning their constraints would be beneficial and so then i created demand and so what i've consistently done in my marketing is transform latent desires into current demand. And so it's given me the ability to sell things that other people couldn't sell. In fact, when I think about what parts of marketing I am really good at, that is the part that I am best at, that there's a lot of marketers out there who can sell what people want a lot better than me. I feel I'm one of the best at selling what it is that people don't think they want and be able to get people to want something. And I also think it's one of the reasons why I've been doing this for 20 years and I've been able to have the reputation that I have because I never sold stuff that people wanted because most times, most novices don't, they know what they want, but what they want is not necessarily what's best for them. And, and anyone who's an expert in any area can probably understand that. When you're able to sell something that and market it effectively and not be a slave of what people desire right now, 
then you have the ability of actually serving people stuff that is in their best interest by getting them to want it. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I've done as well as I have. So anyway, that was not my intent of this live stream was not to give you my history, but hopefully even in the stuff that I'm sharing opens your mind to what's possible and gives you a better perspective of how to think, right? Like, because to do what I did with the reports, right? The free reports and those free reports are very different than the report that you can get here in this Facebook group, but I'm going to get rid of this so that the whole, so it's not up the whole time. Um, but, uh, you know, I had two different goals when I wrote a marketing report, it was really to shift the beliefs of the market. And when I write, when I wrote a client report, um, that was more about getting my clients a specific outcome. So one was about shifting beliefs. One was about creating a new outcome. So founders club, which is, was the name of the continuity program that Todd Brown and I created when Todd used to work in strategic profits. Um, those were the reports that I wrote were inside of there. And, you know, the first report was all about how do you take an idea and turn that into a business that you ultimately get free of. And I'm going to circle back to that because there was an idea that I shared in that, that I still to this day haven't seen out there that often. And, uh, and I haven't shared it in a long time. And I think it could be beneficial to a lot of you. Uh, the second report I wrote was it the second? I think so. The second report I wrote was, uh, it was either the second or the third, was all about automated webinars because it was my company, Strategic Profits, that invented automated webinars. I gave it to Mike Filsane, who developed Evergreen Business Systems and then EverJam and EverWebinar. I gave it to Russell Brunson when his business was in trouble and it helped turn his business around. And so uh, that report, that founder's report, was how I thought automated webinars were going to be the future of uh, online business. This is back in 2007, I believe. And, um, and I guess I was right on that. Um, and then uh, the last report that I specifically wrote uh, was the report I'm giving away in our uh, free Facebook group called The Hidden Obstacles. After that, we still wrote another 20 or so reports, but I recognized that it wasn't my wonderful writing skills that people were reading my reports for. It was my ideas. And that I could actually spend more time on the idea by bringing on a writer that worked with me full time to uh, go through my notes with me, to create a table of contents with me, to then go off and write it and then come back with me and I could go back and forth with them. And so uh, Chuck Dolce was uh, the writer and uh, we created some great reports together. And so that is... Uh, Founders Club, that's one of the reports I'm giving away. Now, to go back to the idea that I was just going to share about what was in that first report was this idea of which this first report I wrote, which was called, um, I think it was called Your Business Blueprint, which was not to be confused with another report, I not a report, a document I had called My Business Blueprint or The Business Blueprint which was a swipe file that was about, I think like 360 pages of everything I did in year one of strategic profits to go from zero to $7.4 million, right? But in your business blueprint or my business blueprint, whatever I called it and I don't remember, um, I basically wanted to walk people through this process of like having an idea for a business, right? Recognizing that that is a promise that you're making to a group of people. And if people want that promise, right, your customers, they are going to give you the lifestyle that you want. So there's this overall trade, right? Obviously there's layers to this and that report, I don't remember if it was 70 or 80 pages, but um, I'm not gonna go through the whole 70 or 80 pages here. Um, but there is a big idea here that I wanna share with you. And so, one of the ideas, and this isn't the bigger idea, but I think this is a valuable idea, is that one of the ideas is, is that your business ultimately is a system, your entire business, right? There are systems within that system, right? Subsystems and processes, but your entire business is a system for your customer to get an outcome. 
And so the easiest way to think about it, or one of the easiest examples I've ever come across is comparing Netflix and Blockbuster, not because these are the best systems or anything like that, but it's just very easy as a comparison to recognize that both Netflix and Blockbuster were systems that were designed to watch movies at home in its outset, right? Um, both were systems where the customer would use that system to get the outcome of watching home entertainment. Because the Netflix system was superior to the customer, they won at the end of the day. Now, there's a bunch of reasons we could argue about them, but at the end of the day, the usefulness of this is to recognize that your business is a system that gets your customer an outcome. And the more of that outcome that they can get, the more certain that they get that outcome, the faster they get that outcome, the better. It took me, I don't know, 10 years when I was uh, working with Russell Brunson on something different uh, to recognize that, you know, that he was a master at offers and that I wasn't. And so, you know, part of the reason he was a master at offers was that it felt like he was giving you so many things that from the customer's experience, it felt like there was very little I had to do next to get the outcome. And my way of structuring the offer never felt that way. And if we take the understanding that my business is a system, right, that the customer uses or doesn't use uh, to get that outcome, I could understand uh, why Russell's was far superior. And so your offer is kind of a reflection of your system, you could say. You know, what is the customer going to have to spend? But more importantly than what they spend, what are they going to have to do? And how many of the pieces are removed off of their back and put on your back for them to get that ultimate outcome? You know, if I'm going to teach you how to sell high ticket stuff, right? And I have this whole module about how to find the ideal commission only sales rep. That's valuable, right? But if I give you the ad to place that every time it's run, it gets 100 people to apply for a commission-only sales rep, and then I give you a survey questionnaire that you have all those people take that will immediately spotlight the one person out of the 100 that is worth hiring, and then three, I give you the actual like employee agreement that I'm certain they will take, that will also ensure that they work their ass off for you. And the, com and the commission structure in place that will make sure that they profit and want to grow your business and yours do, it's totally different than just a module teaching you how to find that person, right? One is a far superior system and that we're basing that on the quality of the offer at the end. And we're not just using, I get this, when I give you that, but like I give you this and I get that. And then what else do I have to do to get that final outcome? Right. I mean, you could say that, you know, at the end of the day, in the beginning of Netflix, they were the same. Like you both, you had to do some other stuff to get the outcome, but it was easier to do it through Netflix than it was through Blockbuster. And therefore Netflix won. All right. So your business is a system, right? And the easier, better system often wins, not always, but oftentimes does. So what I shared in this founder's report was that, uh, you know, you're building a system and part of the system, you could say the engine of that system is your profit model. Like how is your business going to get customers, right? At what price, how are you going to acquire customers? And how much is it going to cost to acquire those customers? And what are those customers going to be worth to you lifetime, right? Because the you could, if you take the average cost per customer acquisition and, and you subtract that from the average lifetime value of a customer and you multiply that by the total number of customers, you have the amount of overall profit that the business made. And so... You know, the engine is about acquiring customers at the cheapest price possible to allow the business to go at a certain speed or to be at a certain amount of profit and extract the maximum amount from customers where they're still happy, where they're engaged, where they refer others, etc. So that's the elements of your profit model. And 
what I was instructing entrepreneurs to do, because remember, I'm walking someone through the idea of coming up with an idea for a business that satisfies their needs. What is their ideal life look like? Right. Uh, and what does the customer want and how much of how good of a system are you building to give the customer that then the profit model that's going to be the engine of that business. Then the last step was to create a mind map of everything that will be required for that business to run every task, every activity, right? And you could do it on a, you could do it in an outline. You could do it on anything, but I suggested that people do it in a mind map and that they color the mind map based on who's going to do it. Now in the beginning, if you're working all by yourself, guess what? It's your color across the mind map, but the program was called founders club. And so the goal of my reports was to help people first be entrepreneurs, but then ultimately to be the founder of a business. And in my mind, a founder of a business was not someone who was running the day to day anymore. And so when you had the mind map color coded by who was responsible for each of those tasks, you could then make the game of business to grow the business while at the same time getting your color off the mind map. Because when your color was off the mind map, guess what? You had no more day-to-day -day responsibilities. Now, that was part of the game of being a founder, and that's what I was recommending entrepreneurs do before they even start their business. And um, I also saw that in the comments, someone uh, mentioned, uh, what's his name, Ash, uh, Moria, uh, who wrote a really good book on, uh, uh, on lean called scaling lean using theory of constraints. I'm a fan of Ash's good book. Um, probably the best book I ever read on lean was, uh, nail it, then scale it. And let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> um, because these are all relevant to thinking, right? So part, and I don't feel like the book that was really popular, I forget who wrote it. Um, but you know, the gentleman who really pioneered lean as an approach to growing a business was Stephen Blank. Um, I forget what his, one of his students, Eric something, but that was like the best selling book on it. And I thought it was a very watered down version, no offense to him, but it didn't compare to what Stephen had created. Uh, I don't know any of them, but you know, just as an outside reader, uh, I was, I was sad to see. Eric Reese, I think was his name, his book be the most popular when in fact, I thought it was the least good of the group. Uh, but anyway, um, but the concept, Eric Reed, is that the guy's name? Okay. Uh, the Eric Reese. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, so, but the concepts, no matter which book you read are very valuable. And that is, is that the startup of a business is really just an experiment. And it's an experiment where you have a bunch of assumptions. And when, you know, we walk around making assumptions all day long, but when you're starting a business, all you have are a group of assumptions. You're assuming who the customer is going to be. You're assuming that the problem that you're solving is a problem that customers will pay to solve. You're assuming that the channels that you're going to use to find those customers will be fruitful and that you'll find those customers. You are assuming right? That, uh, you'll be able to get those customers for less than they are worth to you over the long haul. You're assuming that certain, uh, key partnerships, vendors, software programs, what have you, uh, will be what you need to build this business. So you're making a ton of different assumptions. And part of lean was recognizing that you're making these assumptions and to articulate the actual assumptions you're making. Because if you can articulate the assumptions you're making, then the goal of the startup phase is not to make a bunch of money. The goal is to actually validate or invalidate those assumptions. Now, why would it be about invalidating or validating assumptions as opposed to making a bunch of money? Because you could make a bunch of money in a business, get it off the ground, find out that you have some invalid assumptions, and then watch the money that you brought in quickly disappear. You could bring in a bunch of money, have some invalid assumptions, and then get stuck in that business. In other words, never be able to get past a certain 
stage of scalability. And because of that, now you're trapped in this business. Maybe you're making six figures, low six figures, but there's no chance you'll ever make seven figures. And now you're stuck in this business, kind of like a pair of golden handcuffs, right? And so, you know, I've always envisioned it as kind of like an entrepreneur starts a business with this like view of the summit of a mountain and they want to get to the top and most never get to the top. Right now, why don't they get to the top? Well, for the most part, because they've made some incorrect assumptions. Right. And whether they bottom out right at the beginning or whether they get stuck somewhere in the middle of the mountain, uh, it's because there was something that was invalid in the assumptions that they made about their business. And so lean is all about articulating those assumptions and then figuring out the best way to validate or invalidate those assumptions as quickly as possible. And the concept of pivoting came about from the idea that when you come across an assumption that you now recognize is invalid, your business model, your business model, was based on an assumption that you now know is not true. You have to pivot. You have to adjust the business model in order to now take, incorporate what you've just learned and now validate or invalidate that next assumption. But we make assumptions in everything, right? Uh, you know, I'm doing this live stream. I'm making the assumption that people will show up. I'm, assum I'm assuming that the stuff I'm sharing right now is helpful for you. If it is, give me some feedback and let me know that. I'm assuming, you know, I'm making the assumption that of all the things I could be sharing, that this will impact a certain number of you a certain way, or that if I didn't, maybe I should be talking about something else. And so we make assumptions in everything. A lot of times the stakes aren't that high on the assumptions that we make. But, you know, I wrote about this in the manifesto and I wrote about this in the missing chapter that the assumptions that you make in business are some of the most important assumptions that you will ever make in your life. You know, who you marry determines who you're going to, who's going to be your partner in life, right? Most entrepreneurs spend as much time, if not more time in their own business than they do with their spouse, right? And so when you start to think about that, the amount of time you spend in your business is that significant. And so, if you're building a business on faulty assumptions, it's as damaging to your life as marrying the wrong person. And so when you consider that, right, this, this is another way I've always liked to describe it. Business is the game that you're going to play for money for the most amount of money that you will ever play for. So I talked about this in the missing chapter that I had this client, Gene Carlo, who was a world ranked tennis player. I'm a good tennis player. I started playing tennis when I was like three or four years old. Um, back then, they didn't even have kids' rackets. They took a wooden racket, they cut it in half, and we had a tennis court in my backyard, and I learned to play when I was really young. But I am not a world-ranked tennis player, nor am I even in the ballpark of a world-ranked tennis player. So I would be an absolute fool to play Giancarlo tennis for money. Right. And I'd be an even bigger fool to bet all the money that I'm going to make in my life on a game of tennis with Gene Carlo. But picking the wrong business is doing exactly that. Now, I happen to be a really good poker player and I did some projects early on with poker stars and Howard Letterer and a bunch of those guys. In fact, I was offered uh, the, the marketing for Full Tilt and I'm happy that I said no, because I would have spent time in jail if I had said yes. But. I'm a good poker player. I would play Giancarlo poker for money because I'm a much better, I think I'm a much better poker player than he is, but I'd never play him tennis for money. And so when you recognize that business is the largest bet you're ever going to make, it's the biggest game that you're ever going to bet the most on, then wouldn't you want to make sure that everything that you think this business is going to be is correct in your thinking. And the way you do that is whether is by validating and invalidating assumptions. So, uh, so that's kind of the gist. Now, what I was going to do was kind of walk you through some of the report that you can get for free when you join our free Facebook group. Uh, and I just also want to let you know, like there's, I'm not playing 
you know, I'm not even trying to be slick with any of this. Like you join our free Facebook group. You don't even have to give us your email address to join our Facebook group. Uh, you get the report by right clicking. There's no opt in. Um, do I want to grow my list? Of course I want to grow my list. I have been absent from the market for about five to seven years, depending on which part of the market we're talking about. But, uh, but I only want people on my list that want to hear from me. And I only want to talk to people who want to hear from me. And so my hope is, is that like, based on what I'm talking about today or on any of these Facebook lives, based on what you see from me in this report that you can get for free in this Facebook group, that you want to hear from me. And if you want to, then you can opt into our list. But I'm not trying to trick you. It's not my goal. I've been doing this long enough to know that that's long term, not an effective strategy. I play the long game. It's one of the reasons why I think I've been successful. It's one of the things I teach my clients. There's a lot of ways to get people really excited today. I could hop in front of a bunch of Ferraris and Lamborghinis and paint a lifestyle picture that many people want. And the split tests show that that is actually more effective. So I'll just like, I've been behind a lot of businesses. I can tell you for absolute certainty that those businesses and those gurus make more money in the short run. They definitely do, but long-term they don't. So it's a question of whether you're playing the long game or the short game. And I've just been around long enough to see that, well, this, right? From my, my opinion, other people could disagree. It's better to have never been rich than to be rich and then lose it. Because then you walk around on a daily basis remembering what you don't have, what you can no longer do. So there have been times in my life where I've struggled. Every entrepreneur has had times like that. I'm, I'm late to the game, but I'm reading Elon Musk's biography right now. I know I'm like eight years late or however many years it's been out. But I never really was motivated to read it. Uh, then I listened to his last interview on Joe Rogan, and I just all of a sudden wanted to read it. And he goes through this horrible time, right, where he could have lost everything. And Steve Jobs also went through this horrible time where he could have, like, if you read Walter Isaacson's book, that was a great book on Steve Jobs. Uh, every entrepreneur goes through some period in their life where they could have lost everything. And oftentimes they have to rely on friends or acquaintances. And it's their reputation that at the end of the day, with a few people, that matters the most. And I don't know why I went on to that. Um tangent. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I play the long game. And I think that anyone that's smart plays the long game. And oh, yeah. So I remember numerous times. So like, they've had their hard times. Um, but I've always been a never been as money motivated as maybe some people around me would like me to be. But I'm always been an info fiend, right? An info addict. And um, I've always been able to buy as many books as I want. And that's important to me. And um, but there have been times in my life where I went to a bookstore and I wanted five books and I could only buy one. And that was painful for me because like that I was used to being able to go in and buy 20 books if I wanted to, or 50 books. Not that I often bought 50 books at one time, but I could. And, uh, and then not being able to do that made me less satisfied with that one book I bought. And had I never been in a place where I could buy 50 books, maybe I would have walked out with that one book, been really happy. The people I knew growing up that were the least happy were kids whose families were wealthy and then very poor. And so, hence, my, that was why I went on that tangent. Uh, the worst thing to do is to be rich and then poor. It's, in my opinion, better to be mediocre, me, medium all the way through than that contrast. Because you a lot of it's the hedonic treadmill, but on an incline that leads to frustration. Anyway, so I could go through the, the report. That's what I was planning on doing today. And then I just went on this long riff. Um, so I thought... Instead of maybe now going into the report, maybe we'll hit the uh, comments, see what people are saying. And then if we have time afterwards, we'll, we'll go back to the report. But you can get the report um, anytime you want in this Facebook group below. And uh, let's see. 
So let's see here. Let's get rid of the link to the Facebook group again. Or let's see, maybe I could just make it smaller if that's possible and make the font. Yeah, so we'll do that. Move that up here. And uh, we'll play an air horn because I think that's fun. I just love that I can do that. And now we'll go into questions. Okay. Uh, so some shout outs. Uh, so Sava wanted to know if where the email, where the report is. And I've said that numerous times. So you're good there. Uh, Bailey, uh, hope you're well. Shout out from the UK. Right back at you, Bailey. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, Craig, I am your BGS customer. Love your stuff and knowledge you have to share. Thank you, man. Uh, Kat, uh, hi, Rich. Hi, right back at you. Chris Vogelman, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, looking good in the hood. Yes, I'm in my gym. Uh, in the Hamptons, that's where I've been relegated so that the rest of my family can enjoy the house and not have to be quiet. Um, so yes, that's why. And this gym, this house was actually built in 1829. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt stayed here. It's a historic, national historic landmark. Um, this gym was not built at 1829. I think it was built in the 70s or 80s. I don't know. And that's why you see that um, it looks like I'm outside because this used to be the end of the house, but then there's this little room here that is the rest of the, you know, the rest of the gym. And I have a Peloton over there. I have this great elliptical um, over there that actually is unlike any other elliptical I've ever seen. Most ellipticals go like this. This is an Octane Fitness LX8000, and the L stands for lateral. So the, the legs go like this. So whenever I get back here and I first start working out on it, it always gets my legs really sore. I've been here now since March 14th, so I'm, I'm totally fine now. Uh, anyway, let's go back to this. Uh, John Howard, all minus two minutes. Yes, that was the countdown. Uh, Ron Williams from Champaign, Illinois, birthplace of the internet. Interesting. I had a college buddy that was from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, I try to get on everyone again. I am from Villanova, Pennsylvania. Cool. Uh, not going to show all of yours, Chris. Uh, cool. Shirag, is that the right way to pronounce it? Shirag from India. You know, it always blows me away how, how international any uh, email list or Facebook Live or, or Facebook group is. It's kind of insane, isn't it? Uh, agree with the politics, but it was still great, raw, and authentic because you could really tell you really uh cared and i do and i just feel that um i just feel like too much politics has gotten in the way of truth honesty and what's best for the everyday person and it's a shame uh all right hey rich i'm excited about today's topic thank you for tackling it i want to level up my thinking so i can make better decisions in the context of my personal life than take those skills to build a long-term business so yeah so i wrote this report called the hidden obstacles of success and you can get it up there there um and it's really a report all about thinking and uh the road to less stupid is also a book all about thinking and he gives you a bunch of questions uh that are really useful in figuring out what it is you think like have you ever sat down and really thought about what are my customers most concerned about what expectations do I have for the people who work for me? Or what expectations do I have to the person who I'm outsourcing this project to? And given it more than five minutes, right? So I, like some of the best ideas of my life have come from writing time in my journal. And more often than not, it started with a question. And sometimes I didn't open the journal with the thought that I was going to answer that question, but I was writing about something which stimulated a thought. And then that stimulated a question. And so like the Internet Business Manifesto, the report that changed my life, I was writing in there and I was bitching and moaning about my frustrations, about how I had been successful in the music business, the fashion business, the hypnosis business. And now I was struggling in the online marketing business, which I thought was going to be the easiest. And then I asked myself, well, why am I struggling? What am I doing differently? And then the, my answer was the beginning of the Internet Business Manifesto. So 
yeah, I, I don't, I would have never came to that if I didn't have a place to write and think. So that's an example. Um, wow. Darren Lee Joseph, I am jealous. You are in sunny Bermuda, although the weather has finally gotten pretty okay here. We have like 60 to 70 weather every day for the last couple of days. Finally, we broke the 50s. Finally, we can go outside. I can smoke a cigar, although I can't smoke a cigar here because that's against Facebook's rules. We're only a happy place where no one has any issues uh, when we're on Facebook. Uh, okay, yep, I already went through that. I already went through that. Hey, Carlin. So Carlin was a customer, a client of mine from... 15 years ago and it's great to still see you Carlin and I'm glad that you got the report I would have thought I would have sent you the report so I apologize that I never did send it to you but I'm glad you're reading it now hey Rich from Michigan and thanks for doing these live events I've enjoyed every one that's awesome Kevin and thank you for saying that and thanks for you for joining me and thank you to each and every one of you who've joined me and you know I'm also trying and you know it's funny because uh, so one of the things I do is um well i've noticed something and so i'll share this thought with you i um so gary vaynerchuk used to speak at my events a gazillion years ago um i remember he spoke at an event of mine in orlando back in 2008 and it was very clear to me even back then that like when i was speaking um like i i compared and contrasted uh how i was communicating and i've always been very comfortable on stage in fact i'm an introvert but for some reason, talking to a group of people, if the group is big enough, I've always felt safe and comfortable and I like it. I like to talk to groups. But when I was presenting, I was really, quote unquote, presenting like you, there was a difference in my communication and Gary's. And it felt like Gary was really having a conversation with the audience and I was presenting to the audience and it didn't bother me. Um, and, and, you know, that's the way Gary is. Cause like after that seminar, Gary and I went to the first South by Southwest together and, um, and that's Gary, like the way Gary was on stage is the way he is off stage. And for the most part, the way I am on stage is the way I am off stage or, um, well, I hear I'm more like Amrit Sheffern and this is, this is how it is on stage. It's not an act. It's just my, I guess how I am when I'm on stage, but I also, um, so, you know, I work in a division of Agora and the, the division that I work in is uh, Paradigm. And the gentleman who runs Paradigm is Pete Coyne. And uh, in the division that I'm in, Robert Kiyosaki is in, Grant Cardone is in, and a few others. Jim Rickards and Tim Sykes. Uh, and anyway, so Grant Cardone was, so they, they were doing an event for Paradigm. And it was all the financial gurus, of which I'm not a financial guru. I'm a business guru, right? So I wasn't there to speak. I was just there to witness. And uh, Grant Cardone was speaking. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I wanted to dislike Grant. And I don't know why I wanted to dislike him. Maybe I'm envious. Maybe, I don't know. I just, I wanted to dislike him. And, uh, and I do disagree with some of his concepts. But that's not, I could disagree with someone's concepts and not want to dislike someone. But yet he was so charismatic on stage that he won me over. And, and I went, you know, so I went into this room and there was not that many people there. Maybe there's like 100, 200 people, not that many. And I went in wanting to dislike the guy and I walked out liking the guy. And I thought to myself, like, damn. I, that is not something I know how to do. In fact, there have been people who've walked in wanting to like me who I know have walked out not liking me. And so another reason why I want to do these Facebook Lives is I want to get better. That's at speaking. And, you know, part of it is practice. Part of it is getting more comfortable in my skin. But what's interesting is, is that another thing I do is that when something's important to me, oftentimes I will start to explore uh, I'll, I'll start to explore possibilities as to what I should be doing. So I started, uh, when did I start? Let's see. I'm looking here. I guess I started yesterday, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. 
So I started yesterday. So, so far it's been yesterday and today. And, and the idea there is uh, I started with a sentence stem. And I've always been a big uh, fan of sentence stems. And a sentence stem is you basically start a sentence and then you end it a bunch of times. And so when, I'm, when I want to do something, I will, uh, or learn something or figure something out, I will do the same sentence stem, do 10 answers a day for a week. And then I'll look at my answers for the week. So there'll be 70 answers. And then I'll pick the ones that I believe are the most useful, be beneficial, most time efficient, whatever. It depends on the issue uh, that I will uh, then act on. So uh, I was uh, uh, what I wrote was if I were to take on the project to be better both on stage and on camera, I'd dot, dot, dot. That's the sentence stem. Right. Uh and then I wrote, watch Grant Cardone video from the Paradigm seminar and note what exactly he's doing. Because I went, you know, I was there and I felt different, but I never really went back, watched the video, took notes as to not on the content, on his presentation style. What was it about him that made it work, right? Watch the Gary Vaynerchuk video from the Strategic Profits event and note what he's doing. Go through the Hank Norman course. Uh, so the Hank Norman was a guy that supposedly worked with um, Grant Cardone. So Grant would go through the, the Hank Norman course, read the book, likability switch and take notes on it. Review my notes on related books like the charisma myth, etc. Compile all my notes on charisma and practice in front of a mirror. Get back to Mars and Michelle, two friends of mine who are also interested in being better on camera. Engage with the guy, uh, Okay, that's a friend of mine, so I'm not going to say his name. Engage with that friend of mine. Uh, well, I could say engage with Joel Bauer. Um, critique my own performance on videos. Be more intentional every time that I get on camera. Right. So that was day one, and I've done it. I did it again today. But that's how, like, that's thinking, right? Like, if I sat down to try and come up with 70 ideas in one fell swoop, uh, there's no way I could. But if every day I come up with 10, uh, if I'm not satisfied with any of those answers, I'll then come up with another 10, I mean a day until I do, but like, but every day I'm spending a little bit of time. And because I'm spending a little bit of time each day, I'm also more likely to notice for, uh, other opportunities to get better. And in fact, this live stream was probably the first live stream that I've done, you know, on these Facebook lives where I got clear about what my intention was. And my intention was to come to you with an attempt with my best effort to make a difference in your life because at the end of the day my belief is is that i don't need to focus on quote unquote being better that what will be felt energetically like kind of through the camera is my passion on the topics and my concern or my care for making a difference in your life now maybe that's not true maybe there's other ways to be better on camera and i'll figure that out but in every other time because I'm such like an info guy and I need to must have as much info as possible, must be as prepared as possible. I spend every last minute um, thinking about what I'm going to cover. And today, like I spent some time thinking about what I was going to cover. But when I hit the switch for the two minute countdown, instead of wrangling up last minute thoughts or ideas or concepts, I just sat here and thought about what my intention was. And maybe that makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't, right? Um, I can tell later on by how I felt about it, how you guys felt about it. Um, but I don't find it too surprising that this is the first time that I was intentional about that. And I just started writing sentence stems about it yesterday. Because it's now more front consciousness as opposed to something I might or someday or something like that. And so... You know, part of using our brain better for our business is not only spending time thinking, which I think at the end of the day is one of the is the most important thing you can do for your business uh, other than then acting on those thoughts. Um, and it's so easy to delude ourselves into thinking that we're thinking when all we're doing is recycling thoughts. But I can't give it full justice in a Facebook live, uh, that I could writing over a hundred pages about it 
because your thinking has to be accurate. It has to be clear. It has to be done frequently enough. And then you have to be clear about what it is ultimately that's going to get you from where you are to where you want to be. And most people are not clear where they are. They're not clear where they want to be. They're not exactly clear what they want. They're more clear about what it is they don't want. And if you've never spent any time trying to figure that out, then there's no reason why it should be clear. And there's no reason why you would know that. And, you know, most people plan their vacation better than they plan their business, plan their day, plan their, their success. And, and only because it's forced upon us to make plans for those things. And, you know, my thought is, is that the best thinking should be about your business because you spend so much time in it and it makes such an impact on whether your thinking is good or not. All right. So anyway, let's keep going. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Ulrich, uh, you know, I don't think it's just about to kind of, it's not about getting it right in your personal life and then getting it right in your business. It's about understanding that, um, the quality of your thoughts is going to come down to the amount of time that you spend thinking and you almost don't have to worry about thinking too much because thinking is such hard work that the last thing anyone's going to do is spend eight hours thinking. It would be like, you know, warning someone to be careful about meditating for eight hours. That's not going to be your default. You know, it's hard enough when you start meditating to like to meditate long enough and same with thinking. So, you know, spend time thinking about what it is you really want out of life. What is it that you really want out of your business, right? What is it that, you know, your business should expect from you? What is it that your customers really want? What is it that you're doing to make sure that you get customers and keep customers? You know, there's just a million questions that you could ask yourself. And the goal of having greater clarity when you end that, that I like to write, I think like, you know, I can't think for a few more minutes without losing the beginning of my thoughts. So, um, so I like to write my answers out. Um, I would imagine that might be beneficial for everyone, but I don't know, maybe some people, you know, uh, there's this, um, woman who worked at Agora, Agora, who I have tremendous respect for. Her name is Jenny Thompson, who has a photographic memory, and I was blown away at her ability to rattle off everyone's passport number at the table because all those people worked for her and she saw their passport once. I imagine maybe she wouldn't have to uh, write her way to thoughts. Maybe she would. Maybe all she'd need to do is like see it visual and then remember it forever. But that's not me. And, um, and so I need a trail to follow to get to my thoughts. Um, anyway. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, oh, wow. I hope it's, this is a good comment. Um, Bruce Burdeen, uh, just for the record, being a GPS, BGS, GPS, Founders Club, et cetera, customer of yours since 2007, I've never heard you rant if it, it wasn't that bad at all like you did last week. At least for me, it was very refreshing to have you free yourself to talk at length on all this. Your point of thinking for yourself was clear and set uh, the teaching perfectly. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I, I, I try, I try not to, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like when people infringe their beliefs on me. Um, in fact, I was telling a friend slash colleague of mine, how much enjoyment I got early on, um, a couple years ago when I was, uh, getting on Twitter and each day I would stop following anyone who was spouting their political beliefs so loudly that they just were like interfering with my experience. And I felt gleeful inside like doing that. Um, and, uh, and I don't, we were also talking about like the value of other people's opinions when they differ from you, but in a way where the conversation is elucidating. And there have certainly been new, God knows how many conversations I've had with people who totally disagree with uh, the politics that I believe. 
And when it's done intelligently, I walk away with a newfound appreciation for, for the deeper thoughts behind things that I disagree with. Um, because I know that there are smart people that disagree with me and that doesn't make what I believe stupid. It doesn't make what they believe stupid, but yet too much of today is very polarized and we have to kind of people are made, people automatically assume the other side is wrong. All right. Um, Chris, can you speak to neuroplasticity and the real neuronal changes in the brain? Many people often undervalue the power of thought and belief. Yes, sure. Well, you know, um, I think there, I forget the book, if it was the talent code or the talent myth, but one of those talks about intention and how big of a difference intention makes, you know, that a kid could practice like, and I'm going to probably get some of this wrong because it wasn't, you know, when I read information like this, I'm not trying to get every fact right. I'm trying to learn the gist of what's important for me to move forward with an understanding of what I'm going to change. And um, so it was either the talent myth or the talent code. And it was about how uh, a kid could practice like piano an hour a day. And if they saw themselves playing piano as an adult, it could mean more than if a kid practiced, let's say, three hours a day, but didn't see themselves playing piano as an adult. And that the intention that would make a difference in how the brain coded it, that the more intention that this was an important skill or knowledge, the more myelin sheath would be uh, created around the dendrite or whatever, and I might get the biology wrong, and that would make the processing faster and make it last longer. And so uh, intention has a lot to do with it. I also have taken ADD medication on and off for the last 15 years. And, um, you know, uh, and there are certain nootropics that are very helpful in protecting uh, the dopamine receptors. Because Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, uh, can fry those dopamine receptors. I'm a big fan of taking care of your brain. I believe in that wholeheartedly. And I try to do the best I can in taking care of my brain as much as I can. Uh, everything from getting a good night's sleep every night to taking every single, um, every single supplement I can that I know is beneficial for brain health. Um, things like L-carnosine, which help get the trash out of your brain cells to, uh, well, I'm not going to go into all that, although maybe I'll do a Facebook Live on the nootropics I take and why. Um, but they're definitely, you know, if you study and then don't sleep, they're, it's almost like wasted, right? It's kind of like reading a self-help book that has lots of exercises and questions and doing none of them and then moving to the next book. Right. So I talked about a book that I just recently read um, called Contagious You. And I thought it was going to be a book related to what I was talking about earlier as far as uh, getting better on camera, being more, quote unquote, contagious. Um, it's kind of about that, but it's not in the angle or avenue that I originally expected. But I loved the book and the book is much more about your presence and are you someone who shows up and raises the energy in the room or are you someone who kind of lowers the energy in the room? So you could say it's very much appropriate to what we were talking about um, as it relates to what one of my goals are. But, uh, you know, so all I've done so far is I've read it quickly on the elliptical. And because I read it quickly on the elliptical and I knew I liked it and I thought it was really good. And it was written by Anise Kavanaugh. And I've reached out to her now like on Twitter, I sent her a tweet. On LinkedIn, I sent her a message. I followed her now on Facebook because I'm a new fan of hers. Um, so I read it quickly on the elliptical. It takes me about two hours to read a book on the elliptical. Then uh, I read it again on my iPad, highlighting what was important. Then I took those highlights and exported them and put them into Evernote. And I've now formatted it in Evernote. And now the next time I'll read it, now I'll follow uh, Tiago Fort's process, which is uh, progressive summarization. That's one of his processes. So the first time now I'll read my highlights. Uh, the first time I go through those highlights, I'm going to bold anything that I find important of the important stuff I highlighted, right? Because that's all that's in Evernote is what I highlighted. 
Uh, then after the next time I go through those notes, I will only be looking at what I bolded and I will highlight what I think is most important of what I bolded, right? So now I'll highlight what I think is most important. And then finally, um, I will look at what I highlighted and I will write my own comments, my own thoughts, my own feelings about those things in addition to doing the exercises and doing all the steps um, because those are the hardest things to do, right? It's so easy to move on to the next book. And I do move on to the next book. Like I'm reading Elon Musk's biography right now and I just finished The Road Less Stupid and tomorrow I'll finish Elon Musk's biography and I'll read something else. But I won't, uh, after I read Elon Musk's biography, I'm not going to highlight it, and I don't need to. Uh, and The Road Less Stupid, I'm going through and I'm taking out all the questions because those are valuable to me. I, I'll, most of the stuff, the rest of the stuff that he's talking about in the book is stuff that I've taught. So we're on the same page, but the questions are great. And, uh, and that's the process that I go through. But that's my unique process, right? Um, and... Uh, I do feel like I have gotten smarter and smarter and smarter every year that goes by and that there's a wider gap between me and friends of mine um, who have not. And so I don't know that I'm really answering your question, Chris, but, you know, there is, I forget the woman's name who wrote about the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset and the understanding that you can get better and better over time. We grow new brain cells until the day we die. We used to, you know, science used to think, we used to think, I, I didn't used to think anything. Uh, science used to think that like once we get, became an adult, our brain cell, like the number of brain cells stopped. That's not true. Uh, they now know that the number of brain cells, you, you, you generate new brain cells all the time. And, um, and your brain health is incredibly important. And one of the ways to keep your brain healthy not the only way. I mean, there's supplements, there's nutrients, there's all those kinds of things. But one of the ways is, is to consistently challenge your brain. And so thinking actually is one of those things that keeps you mentally sharp. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, like your brain really, aside from the fact that if you're going to have a business, your brain is going to determine that level of success because it's going to determine how you think. But like, if you're not really there, do you want to be here? Right. You know, that's why when someone's brain dead, oftentimes we pull the plug. And so if you're not, you know, and my belief, and this is not only my belief, I, I feel this to be true, right. Is that everything in life, you know, there, if you ever read the slight edge, it's a great book. Um, I think I talk about it in this report. Um, although I might not give him credit. And if I don't, I, I feel bad about that. Um, I definitely read it before that I wrote that report. Um, but The Slight Edge, also a great book. And it's all about how the things in life that get you to your goals or take you away from your goals are all easy to do. They're easy not to do as well. And that everything in life, and this I've always believed to be true, you're never static. You know, you're either growing or you're shrinking. The world is consistently changing. You're either getting closer to your goals or you're getting further away from your goals. So in every area of your life, there is a trend. You're either getting in better shape or you're getting in worse shape. There is staying in the same shape. And so you're either getting smarter or you're getting dumber. And if you're not working to get smarter, then guess what? You're getting dumber. Now, if you're intentional about what it is that you're trying to learn, if you think, if you take care of your brain, if you do all those things, uh, a poster fell down, that's what's getting my attention, uh, then you are getting smarter. If you're not doing anything, then you're getting dumber. If you're spending your time just like, yes, Keith Cunningham is the guy that wrote The Road to Less Stupid. Uh, give props where props are due. Uh, so let's see, okay. Uh, Ulrich, the process I'm looking to follow, build logic trees as practice, practice on messaging arguments, reverse engineering your reports and how you reframe beliefs and set up epiphanies. Cool. Uh, good luck with that and share with me what you come across. Um, yeah, I, uh, 
and if you have questions about it, hit me up in one of these live streams. i'll be glad to riff on any of those things.